Postcards from Beyond Written and narrated by Paul Harris Whatever next? Henry Ford, the US car pioneer, said this. I adopted the theory of reincarnation when I was 26. Work is futile if we cannot utilise the experience we collect in one life in the next. When I discovered reincarnation, it was as if I'd found a universal plan. I realised there was a chance to work out my ideas. Time was no longer limited. I was no longer a slave to the hands of the clock. He continued, Genius is experience. Some seem to think it's a gift or talent but it's the fruit of long experience in many lives. The discovery of reincarnation put my mind at ease. I would like to communicate to others the calmness that the long view of life gives to us. Rebirth is a fundamental principle of the Buddha's teaching. The views surrounding what happens when we die were the same in the Buddha's own day as they are now. In essence, there are three main possibilities. One life and then oblivion. One life and then either eternal heaven or eternal damnation. Or thirdly, an infinite series of lives. The Buddha maintained that it was the third of these views that best reflects what actually happens. And, because of this, living in conformity with this view will significantly reduce one's suffering. People often ask for evidence of rebirth as a way of allowing them to have faith in it. This is difficult. It's impossible for science to determine whether conscious experiencing does continue after the death of the physical body precisely because no objective physical measurements of it can be made. Science, just as with all spheres of knowledge, does have limits. There is, however, a large amount of anecdotal evidence available. A scholarly investigation worthy of special mention is 20 cases suggestive of reincarnation by the Canadian psychiatrist Dr Ian Stevenson. Over 40 years, he travelled the world collecting, analysing and testing more than 3,000 accounts of children who claimed they could remember past lives. Personal claims of out-of-body experiences during near-death encounters are notoriously difficult to authenticate, but one example that stands out is that of Canadian Pam Reynolds, who underwent brain surgery to remove a blood clot. The surgical procedure required Pam's body temperature to be lowered to 60 degrees Fahrenheit, that's 16 degrees Celsius. Her breathing and heartbeat stopped and the blood drained from her head. Her eyes were closed with tape and small earplugs with speakers were placed in her ears that emitted audible clicks which were used to check that she had a non-responsive brain. With no brainwave activity and no blood flowing in her brain, she was rendered clinically dead for part of the operation. Yet after the surgery, Reynolds maintained that she remained conscious throughout and was able to accurately describe the procedure and the equipment that the surgeon used as well as the conversations he had with his team members. Does that constitute proof of life after death? No. The reality, however, is that none of us has very long to wait to find out the truth for ourselves first hand. The question is, does that bother you? And do you realise just how much your belief affects the way you live your life. The world is very unfair 
as seen from a one-life perspective. There is no rhyme or reason as to why one person should be born rich, handsome and clever, and another should be born poor, ugly and dim-witted. Life is assumed to be faulty, and we must work like stink to try and redress the imbalance. Then, at the end of a lifetime of unremitting work and struggle, learning, exploring, creating and procreating, we face the agonising prospect of utter oblivion. As Henry Ford's quote suggests, however, being open to the possibility of many lives changes everything. Is it possible that your current situation, whether you consider it to be positive or negative, is the result of your own behaviour? Is it conceivable that the conditions you met with at birth were the result of actions performed previously, and that how you choose to behave now will determine the kind of future life you might experience. Being open to this idea does mean that you have to take proper responsibility for how you behave. You can no longer simply blame your parents, or the government, or society for your unhappiness. But it also means that you become captain of your ship, and that your future happiness is very much in your own hands. As the Buddha suggested, faith and confidence in what he taught comes from applying the principles of his teaching in one's everyday life. Does one's suffering reduce through remaining open-minded to the possibility of more than one life? Being open to the idea of rebirth is essential if we wish to reduce and eliminate suffering. It gives us a new, more tolerant perspective with which we can view the circumstances of our lives. This attitude leads to a more spacious and peaceful mindset, which allows for the development of unbiased observation of our subjective experience. It's through mindfulness that we come to comprehend clearly that it's always the passionate resistance to our circumstances that creates suffering, not the circumstances themselves. This knowledge then empowers us to bring suffering to an end. This is why, when people ask me whether it's possible to follow the Buddha's Noble Eightfold Path without including rebirth, the answer is always no. To walk the path successfully, you need to get your views straight, and that means at the very least being open to the idea of many lives. The Buddha said that were you to collect up the bones of every life you have already lived, if that were possible, the pile would end up being higher than Mount Everest. He also said that craving was the driving force behind renewed existence. It's our never-ending desire for conscious experience that prompts the creation of an endless series of bodies, bodies that inevitably decay and turn to dust again and again. Understanding rebirth is central to understanding the whole problem of suffering to remove rebirth from the Buddha's teaching and still expect to reach the cessation of suffering is like removing the wheels from your car and still expect to drive to work. The Buddha offered a simple way to look at this problem. He said that if you hold a view that life goes on after death and you live your life accordingly, then should it be that conscious experience does not continue, you will die knowing that you have lived a relatively good life, you will leave behind a positive legacy, and you will not have lost anything that you weren't going to lose anyway. Of course, if it transpires that experiencing does continue after death, then, having lived well and in accordance with that view, a happy rebirth is the likely outcome. The reverse, however, is also applicable. 
and one wonders what kind of shock someone who resolutely clings to a one-life view would be in for if it turns out that the flow of conscious experiencing does actually continue in some shape or form after the breakup of the physical base. The Buddha said that every aspect of what he taught can be discovered for oneself. Ultimately, the whole issue of rebirth is resolved through the practice of vipassana. To gain insight wisdom requires an open-minded attitude towards the idea of rebirth. If we hold to the idea of a durable, persisting self that is either annihilated at death or lives on eternally unchanged, then there comes a point when our views are contradicted by the evidence of our own experience. If we cling rigidly to those views, no further insight is possible because we are forced to ignore the evidence. Through Vipassana, we come to see for ourselves that conscious experience arises and passes away moment by moment in a ceaseless but forever changing flow. It's said that you can never step in the same river twice, and close observation of our subjective experience shows us that there is nothing permanent or unchanging in the flow of consciousness. There is no solid entity, no eternal self or conscious witness behind events, and therefore nothing to die at all. One comprehends directly that all the views that arise about what happens when we die are based on an assumption. The assumption that the way things appear to be is actually the way they really are. We discover that all our fears and the views they spawn concerning our mortality are unjustified, based as they are on wrong information. Through generating insight wisdom into transience and conditionality, the understanding blossoms that it's not a case of life versus death at all. You see clearly that, just as a coin has two sides, so life contains both birth and death within it. This same pattern is found in every element of existence, and at every level, from moment to moment, and throughout all the events and circumstances we encounter within this life, and with each successive existence. Everything arises, and everything passes away again. Mind and matter, consciousness, even time and space. But this process has no discernible beginning or end. Everything within life comes and goes, but life itself neither arises nor passes away. It is truly eternal.